my friends, Greg Kokel here, and I am in from my uh, my fishing trip in Wisconsin. I'm going back there in a few days, but I thought I'd just show up and get in the seat again, in the saddle to take your calls and to. And we got a full bank of calls. It warms the cockles of my heart. Uh, but before we get to the callers, every summer I get to participate in one of the most uh, fun events of the year for me. Um, it's uh, something that I've been doing for a number of years in participation with my friend Frank Turek, Mr. New Jersey. Uh, do you want a piece of me, kind of Frank Turek? He's on board with us today. Frank, welcome to the show. It's great being with you all the way from the great state now, not of New Jersey, but of North Carolina, Greg. Yes. So, and well, you're coming project... here because we're going to do CIA here this year in Charlotte. That's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have been doing CIA for how many years now together? This I is think your this, project, of course, but I've been on board every year. I want to say this is going to be year 18. Hmm. It's that 17 long, or 18. Huh? Yeah, we wow. started in 08, so do the um, math. Yeah, no, yeah. you do the math. I'm no, I can't. I'm old. Forget it. <laughs> I have my oh. math, you have your math. Just like I have my truth, you have your truth, there right? There you go, yeah. Uh-huh. CIA cross-examined instructor academy we've been doing it many many years and it's really grown Frank I remember when we first started doing this it was kind of a motley crew of people you assembled to learn how to engage and how to communicate and uh, how to to be more effective apologists and it is really blossomed over the years and many of the people who are instructors now were actually students at earlier CIAs, and uh, they they began to make a difference. They wrote books, they had podcasts, and now they're effective communicators also at the conference. So why don't you tell us a little bit, for those people who are not familiar with the Cross-Examined Instructor Academy, which is really your 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 home base for your whole project as as a, uh, a Christian work here. Why don't you tell us what that's about? Sure. Back in 08, when we first started our ministry here at crossexamine.org, we started in 07. I wanted to try and help people who had an affinity for apologetics, but maybe had no real avenue on in, in which to get better in their presentation skills. And mm -hmm. anybody can read a book, but can you present it? Can you ask questions? Can you interact with people in an effective way? So the first person I thought of, if we were gonna have one of these, how to present and how to ask questions better was Greg Kokel. So I called this guy, Greg Kokel, <laughs> and he came to Charlotte along with Brett Kunkel, no relation, <laughs> and uh, we had a few other folks helping us teach then. I think we had maybe 25 students in year one. Yeah. And uh, we can only take a limited number of people because not only do we present to the students, they present to us and we mm -hmm. critique them and help them get better at presenting and answering questions. So it's really mm -hmm. a presentation school for three days. Mm -hmm. And this year, I'll be an instructor as well as you, Elisa Childers, she's a former student. Oh, Natasha Crane, she's a former student. Wow. Uh, Richard Howe, Jorge Gill, Alan Parr, uh, Bobby Conway, Brett Kunkel, John Ferrer, and uh, they're all going to be instructors. And actually, Greg, we started a new track this year huh. uh, because we wanted, the, wanted people to get the benefit of sitting in on the sessions, even if they don't present. Mm -hmm. So we have a presenter track. There's only two seats left for that. We have about 60 presenters. And then we have about 15 seats left for the non-presenter track. Hmm. So if people just want to come and learn and not present, they can. But they got to go to crossexamine.org and click on events, and they'll see CIA there to apply. Mm -hmm. So you've got quite a few people already signed up. Is that that I understand? Yeah, the we're right there? we're two people away from having. I think I think we have about 60 right now, almost wow. 60. And that's about all we can take because we have 10 instructors right. and six students are assigned to every instructor because mm -hmm. you're going to present to us as a student if you're in the presenter track and mm -hmm. we're going to critique you and ask you questions. In fact, you're going to present twice. That's right. If you come. Uh, this, that is uh, one of the most unique things about what happens at this conference, Frank. Actually, the two unique things. Uh, one of them is this presentation element. 
because uh, there are sessions that we have, plenary sessions, where we have different the different faculty are giving presentations, and that's great for giving them more information. And some of those presentations will help them as speakers. That's you and I uh, do uh, jointly something like that, and I think some others have joined in in the past. But in any event, we want them to be better communicators, but we don't just kind of dish them out information. They get a chance to stand in front of a group and give a presentation, 10, 12, 15-minute presentation or whatever. And uh, then we get to critique, and then they get to do it again the next day with another uh, critiquer, so to speak, another faculty member, and it's one of the few opportunities that that uh, people happen as uh, have an uh, availability of a, an experienced communicator that can then help them communicate more effectively. So there's critique here. There's going to be. Um, feedback and this is the best thing I think about the enterprise now there's another thing too I mentioned two things that I think are really unique that's one of them the second thing is that we're a relatively small group and we're all together it isn't like all the instructors in the green room and everybody else is milling around waiting for the next session to start we share meals together much of the time we are interacting together we sit down and talk with each other it's really an uh, an in-group kind of circumstance and I think this really has a tremendous impact on the students to be able to have that close up and personal interaction with all of the uh, the instructors that are going to be there. Yeah, I think that's the big benefit of it as well. We get to hang out with one another. We like just hanging out, all of the instructors, because we rarely get to work together. Normally, we're lone wolves out there that's going right. to a church or a high school or a college or something. But we love hanging out together. And then we hang out with all the uh, students as well. And mm -hmm. students can ask anything, talk about anything over lunch or dinner, whatever they want to do. And uh, so it's it's a, it's a great place to make contacts in the apologetic slash philosophy slash yeah. theological world. Now, just a clarification, CAA is not an apologetics conference, okay? It's not a place where uh, beginners can learn about apologetics. We mm -hmm. want people that are in motion in some way, that are in the field, uh, not professionally necessarily, or you don't have to have degrees in these kinds of things, but you have to be in play. And what we want to do is help move you to the next level level okay and uh as frank has pointed out <clears throat> the cia is is deliberately kept small so that we can have the personal impact on the lives of those uh conferees presenters whatever that uh that we've been used to having for the last 18 years in this conference so frank uh tell us how people can uh, connect with you if they want to be one of the last two presenters in the presenters group it's all that's left, or if they want to come and just watch others present and then learn the kinds of things that, that everybody's going to be learning at the plenary sessions, how do they do that? Yeah, just go to crossexamine.org, crossexamine with a D on the end of it, dot org, click on events, and you'll see CIA there. And you got to go through an application process. We don't necessarily take everyone. We want to make sure that the people who are coming, as Greg just said there, ladies and gentlemen, have at least some affinity with apologetics. They're not complete newbies, but they've at least read tactics and i don't have enough faith to be an atheist those are the two books we require you to read but you can come and give a presentation on any aspect of apologetics you want uh, it doesn't have to be from either of those two books mm -hmm. and we're going to help not only help you improve your presentation skills but we're going to ask you questions and see how you can deal with a, say a hostile questioner Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's a and, fairly new development. I think we've, we've only been doing that for about four years now, uh, yeah. where that kind of the hot seat. Oh, we do the hot situation. seat, too. That's at the end. Yeah, that's that's my favorite part of the whole thing yeah, is yeah, doing yeah, the hot yeah. seat. Oh, and 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 it is you, you've never seen a progressive Christian come after you when Elisa Childers plays oh. progressive Christian. Man, that L is <laughs> listen, uh, when I was sitting there and then she went into that role uh -huh. and dealing with a student, I mean, chills went up my spine. I thought, <laughs> man, I do not want to be on the other end of this. But of course, Elisa Childers, that's her expertise, and she's mm -hmm. bringing that expertise um, to the table, uh, not only as a lecturer there, or a presenter, but also as a uh, as a counsel. A counselor as a as a as a trainer you know of speakers and she is magnificent she's been to the regular cia and the advanced cia that's when i remember her best she was in my group when she was a regular cia but i uh, i don't remember that session she does but i do remember the other one and she was working on some writing and what came out of that is her whole uh, writing career that kind of blossomed you helped her a lot with writing too greg because i think uh 
she showed you a writing sample and you kind of directed her in the right direction. And now she's written three books. One of them, that's of course, right. with Tim Barnett. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, there at yeah, Stand that's a Reason. Story. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a story in itself, that conversation we had. And uh, she tells the story sometimes on the mm -hmm. air. But yeah, that's what it amounted to. She, would you critique my piece? And you know that when I critique, I'm not looking to give them ice cream. I'm looking to give them insulin. I'm going right. to give them a good critique, oh, yeah. whether it's the speaking or the writing that she had me do. And so she was a bit taken aback by the feedback at the time. But then she said since then, that was the best advice she could ever have gotten, a straightforward honest critique and then she went on of course and not because of my critique but uh she had the she had the chops for this and i helped point her in the d right direction a little bit and then she went on to do a great job with the writing uh alan parr is going to be there again natasha crane also a former student yep. at cia and uh good friends of ours at stand to reason uh brett kunkel of course formerly of stand to reason and and uh it'll be great to see him again we don't uh, get together too often just because because we have separate enterprises now but uh, I'm really looking forward to that. The dates, August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. So that's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Charlotte, North Carolina, you've been jumping around the country every year for the last eight or nine years in different locations. You're back home to your flagship, flagship station, so to speak, <laughs> uh, at... Um, is it still going to be at the is the seminary there? No, no. The seminary is actually sold out to a uh, another school. So we're actually going to be at a big church in Charlotte called Central Church of God, okay. which has a great facility. So we'll be centrally located. And it's only 25, 20, 25 minutes from the Charlotte airport. So uh, if people want to attend, we actually have some recommended hotels people can stay at. Uh, so just go to crossexamine.org, click on events, you'll see CIA there. I would not wait to the end of August. That's the deadline because we're going to fill up before the end of August. So if yeah. you want to be a part of this, you need to uh, you need to try and sign up like today or tomorrow if uh, if you're going to make it. I agree. And it's a wonderful event. And I uh, always look forward to it, Frank, and hanging with you and the rest of the crowd. And and those people have changed over the years. And it's just great to meet new people on the on the uh, on the staff side, on the on the uh the presenter side, the um, professional side, so to speak, but then to meet all the different people, it's just amazing to see how God is moving among oh, yeah. the body of Christ, and we get to see that because they show up, and then we get to give them a boost and move them forward, and, uh, and it's just it's just wonderful. So, once again, the date, August 1st through 3rd, that means you got to show up on what, the, what, 30 for 30 days has to turn? Yeah, 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 you got you to come in the July. night before, yeah, you got to come yeah, in the yeah. night before, yeah. Which would be the 31st, I guess, mm -hmm. of July, and then we have three full days. That's right. Uh, and, for second, third. And, and Charlotte is a hub for American Airlines, so you can get usually anywhere, usually in one flight to and from Charlotte, so yeah, it's a good, great. good location. All right, so it's oh, and now I look. It says here seventeenth annual in my notes. Seventeenth. Oh, it does say seventeenth. You're right. Cross examine yeah. instructor academy. Frank, I'm really looking forward to being with you. I am as well. And in fact, friends, if you're listening to this and you haven't signed up yet, do so now because we're going to fill up. I just wanted we do. It's tradition. We do this every year, Greg. We get on. Yeah. I do it on my pad, podcast. I come on your podcast. <laughs> it's just tradition, but. Yeah. Uh, we're running out of time. We're running out of room. So if you guys want to be a part of that, either in the presenter mode or if you can't make the presenter mode, the non-presenter mode, it's a little less expensive non-presenter mode. Mm -hmm. uh, but check that all out. Non-presenter track, I should say. By the yeah. way, Greg, I don't know if you saw this, but we've had so many good CIA graduates. They actually wrote a book together. It's no called kidding. Faith Examined. Yeah, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, people like Elisa, Natasha, M Melissa Doherty, Clark Bates, Tim Stratton, Alex McElroy, Jorge Gill, Eric Hernandez, Neil Mammon. These wow. are all people that contributed to a book that is called Faith Examined. These are CIA graduates, and they're really unique articles or chapters in that book on some apologetic topic. So mm -hmm. it's got a, pr a pretty rich history now, now that we're in our 17th year. I'll say it. Yeah, that, it's like a fest shrift of mm -hmm. sorts, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, I thought you were setting me up there for a joke, you know, like when uh, YouTube and uh, Twitter and Facebook all got together for one event, one one thing, you twit face. You twit face, yeah, that's so right. I was waiting yeah. for that. 
I was waiting for that to come down. But, well, that's great. Faith examined. Mm-hmm. Fabulous. Okay. Great. We'll see you in, in, uh, in August, the first few days of August, Frank. I'm looking forward to that. And folks want more information, cross-examined with a D, dot org for the event. Cross-examined Instructor Academy, August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. All right. See you then, Frank. All right. Thank you, brother. And God bless to you and Amy. And, and friends, don't forget about STRS podcast because that's where the real intelligent people are <laughs> That's right. on Amy STR Hall. podcast. That's right. Greg, that's you just right. kind of tag along, don't you? Yeah, I uh-huh. just tag along. All right. I just get things going and then uh-huh. she seals and it. And she takes she over. It. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You speak for five thing. minutes. She speaks for 30 seconds and you go, why didn't I say that? <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what happens almost every single time. So, all right, well, that's the time for a break. So let's go to a commercial break and then I'll be back with your calls here on Stand to Reason. Right back here on Stand to Reason, and we have a caller that has to leave in like eight minutes. So I'm going to put Julianne to the head of the class here. Julianne, Louisiana, welcome to Stand to Reason. Thank you so much for taking my call, and sure. I just want to say, like, um, I I love your books and your podcast, and um, you were definitely one of my top favorite apologists out there. Oh, thank you. Um, so my question is, um, at my, so at my college, I'm involved in an apologetic organization called Ratio Christi, and there's a girl who comes to our meetings and calls herself our resident atheist, and um, she's the only person I've met who's, like, actually consistent about, like, morality without God. And mm-hmm. so, like, when I'll have conversations with her, um, you know, she'll just be like, you know, if, well, because I remember your um, tactic from, button but um every time that i try to do that with her she just sort of wiggles out of it by saying oh yeah like um there is morality and i'm just fine with that and okay no so what uh, let me wait up. i'm sorry um julianne you you broke out there for a moment so you what you do is you ask her a question about morality and uh like like taking the roof off here's what your view leads to and then she says i'm okay with that yes yeah. exactly okay and so everything she's okay with, in yes. terms of morals, all right. Right. That's what I understand. Would say that. Okay. So it, it, it's th- this is really odd to hear somebody that is pressing the envelope uh, like that. Um, the key for me when I'm talking with people like that, it's been a long time since I talked to somebody. I had a caller that would call uh, that sounded like that when I worked on KBRT, who would attempt that is that even though when they're having a conversation about it, they can kind of stay consistent with their view, they don't end up living that way. And so when your your friend, when whoever it is you're talking about that's trying to be a consistent moral relativist, which just simply means that they 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 make no moral assessments of any kind because there is no grounds by which you can make moral assessments all right and wrong kind of statements when it comes to ethical kinds of things on that view are just nonsense there because there's no standard for that okay you're not you're not even making sense Uh, as this one person said that's like talking about a snake with legs okay this doesn't even fall into the area of reality kind of thing the problem is they can talk this way but they can't live this way and invariably because human beings, all human beings are made the image of God and they have to live in the world that God made, they are going to make statements that entail moral judgments, and I mean objective moral judgments. But usually you find this out when you, ca- you catch them by surprise when they're not guarding turf, all right? And um, sometimes you maybe engineer a thing like that. And uh, if she's, if, if, let's, just, let's just say that she's um, African-American, let's just say it. And if she comes into the meeting next week, and then you say, look, oh, I'm sorry, we've decided not to allow any African-Americans in any of our meetings anymore. Okay, now that's bizarre, obviously. But um, that might prompt her to say, wait a minute, that's not right. And this is what you want to get her to say something like that's not right so when you in a sense theoretically offer 
a clear case counterexample or, or something taking the roof over. What about this? That means torturing babies for fun is just morally acceptable or only because there's no moral content to it all at all. And she says in conversation, oh, that's fine with me. But when an actual life circumstance presents itself to her that is clearly immoral, she's going to say something. Now, maybe the illustration I gave isn't such a good one. I don't know. I'm just grasping at straws here. But when you have people like this that make statements like, well, morals are relative, when they start talking about the injustice of the legal system, popular topic right now, oppression of people of color. What's wrong with oppression of people of color? Why would you complain about that? Well, that ain't right. Okay, now they've just made a moral statement. And, of course, it isn't right, but a, a person who is a relativist cannot help themselves to moral judgments or moral claims in a world that they deny has any moral qualities at all. See the point there? Yes, definitely. And she does make statements like that. Like in the very same conversation, she claimed that God sending people to hell is horrific. Um, but then when I ask her about that, she just says, well, that's just my opinion. Well, it, it is Okay, let's listen to words for a minute real quickly, uh, because I know you only got a minute here. But it is horrific, but that is a a subjectivistic assessment. That's like saying it really hurts. Okay, well, it does really hurt. Um, One wonders if when she says it's horrific, is what she's saying is that that is really morally horrific that God would send people to hell. And that's a question that needs to be asked for clarification. When you say it's horrific, you mean that it's just not pleasant? People get burned? Yeah, you're right. It's not pleasant. Or are you saying, that ain't right? There's something wrong with a God who does that. And if she affirms the second, in any example that you press her on, if she affirms the the real, genuine moral claim, which I guarantee at some point she's going to do that, uh, then this is where you kind of scratch your head and say, wait, now I'm confused. And this is a very important little s- bridge, an important segue. Now I'm confused. Okay, what do you mean you're confused? Well, wait, you're an atheist. Yeah, that means you're a moral relativist. Yeah, it's only molecules in motion. Yeah, there's no morality. Yeah. Well, then how can this thing be wrong that you just identified as wrong? That's your closed question. That's your, in a sense, kind of mic drop moment. Now, I, I, and I talk about this quite a bit in the, the book Street Smarts. I don't know if you got a hold of that. You might have mentioned it when you were breaking Oh, yes, up. I love that book. Yeah, okay. So, because I, I walk through a couple of scenarios where we play out this same thing. But my, here's my confidence. And this I get from Francis Schaeffer many years ago, that all human beings are made in the image of God as a matter of fact, and they have to live in the world that God made as a matter of fact. That means the world is filled with morality, as it were, and human beings have the ability to be aware of that and to know about that and make moral assessments that are sound and accurate, okay? And uh, that means if somebody denies objective morality, they have to deny reality. And all you have to do is listen long enough for them to start making objectivist moral claims of some sort. And that's when you ask the question about it. Well, wait, I'm confused about that. You, this isn't right. What do you mean it's not right? Well, that well, shouldn't be that way. Wait, that sounds like you're making a moral claim. Are you making a moral claim? Because I thought you don't believe in morality. So what's it going to be? Do you believe in morality and therefore you can say this thing is wrong? And uh, that would make sense of your moral judgment, That, but now it puts you in a new category, right? In a world in which there's moral truth. And that has ramifications for worldview. Or do you want to just say, no, there is no moral truth, there is no God, no moral truth, nothing like that, no morality, therefore I can't invade morally against this behavior that I was just talking about. All I can do is say, I don't like it. And that's where she's stuck. And I, and I, that in my, my, my approach tactically is to, is to force people um, to, to upon the horns of that dilemma, basically, because there's no middle ground here. It, 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 there either is morality or there isn't morality. And if there isn't morality, then no moral statement that she makes is coherent. 
if there is morality, then moral statements are co coherent, but then you have to adopt a worldview in which morality makes sense, and atheism isn't one of those worldviews. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to answer my call. Well, you're welcome, Julianne, and I hope that helps. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Okay, off to your thing. All right, bye. <laughs> right, bye-bye now. Oh, that was good. <clears throat> All right, should we go to the top of the class now again? And this would be uh, in Oregon, Mr. Phil. Welcome to the show. Hi there, Greg. Thanks for talking to me. Sure. Hey, um, considering Philip's one, uh, Philippians 129, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ to not only believe in him, but also to suffer for him, mm -hmm. I'm actually 70 year old, seventy years old and gave my life to Christ 55 years ago, yet I've never really, I don't think, I mean, I don't remember having suffered significant persecution. Mm -hmm. It's not that I haven't suffered. I've suffered a lot, but not directly for Christ. Mm -hmm. Does that have anything to say about my Christianity? Well, it might. Uh, but it may not, and partly because uh, we find ourselves in sociological niches, so to speak, that um, may be entirely friendly to Christian worldviews. So if you're with, in, in just in a certain sense, as an accident of, uh, of geography or whatever, if you're with Christians all the time, and these are your friends, these are your people, these are the people you hang out with, and you're never having any interaction uh, in, in, a, in a substantive way with the non-Christian world, then it's unlikely that you're going to have the non-Christian world pushing back on you in a way that could be called persecution, and that could result in suffering in your case. I know that um, <clears throat> John MacArthur once made the comment, and he was trading on a different verse. I think it's in Timothy, but I'm not sure. And it says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it's similar to the one that you just cited in Philippians. And, uh, and, and his point was, oh, for the people who say that they're not suffering any persecution, it might be because they're not living a godly life in Christ Jesus. It might also be, though, that they are separated from any element in culture that would take umbrage with the life that you're living as a Christian or the views that you have as a Christian. You're the one who's in the best circumstance to assess that. Okay, I don't think right. we should go, go out and be looking for trouble. Um, <clears throat> in fact, um, Paul says in one passage, he says, that you make, it your, make it your aim to lead a quiet life, okay? Work with your hands. You know, we're not troublemakers. Um, he also, uh, when you look at the historical record like a book of Acts, Every time, almost every time, or let me put it this way, many times when there was trouble, Paul looked for an opportunity to flee the, the harsh persecution. The first instance, when he was in, uh, um, where was he going, on the road to Damascus, when he was there, now as a Christian, and making his own disciples, by the way, preaching the gospel very early on, of course, in his Christian uh, life, but he started getting persecuted there, and he, the text says his disciples lowered him over the wall in a basket so he could get away. And so the idea of, of fleeing the persecution, if you're able to, is fine, which also means you shouldn't be looking for it and bring it on yourself. But I think there's a fair statement there that applies to a lot of people. That is, it may be that you are professing to be Christian— but in your circles, you're living your—and I don't mean you personally, necessarily, Phil, I'm just talking about in general. You personally may be living a life of a practical atheist, okay? That is, nobody around you knows you're a Christian. Your Christianity doesn't inform any of the decisions you make. It doesn't cause you to stand up against lies and falsehood and, and things like that. Uh, you're indistinguishable for all intents and purposes, from the non-Christians there. Now, uh, Paul talks about this in Romans 8, when he makes the distinction or the clarification between two types of people and two types of lives, one life after the Spirit and the other life after the flesh. 
And I think in Paul's characterization there, living after the flesh doesn't mean you're like as bad as you possibly would be. It just means that you look like everybody else. And whereas a Christian is on a different trajectory, they're living after the Spirit, and that if the Spirit of God dwells in them, then they're pursuing spiritual goals. If they're, if a Christian is pursuing um, appropriate spiritual goals in, the, goals in the way they live their life, and they're immersed in a, 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 a world system that is anti-Christian, well, there are, going to be, there are going to be times when there's going to be friction, and people are going to push back. And I think that's the kind of issue we're talking about. When push comes to shove, where is your, where is one's fidelity placed? Is it in right. Christ? So you are willing to take the flack, even though it's painful or difficult or uncomfortable, whatever it happens to be in that circumstance? Or are you going to kind of go with the flow and lay low and not say anything when it would be appropriate to speak. Again, doesn't mean you have to speak in every circumstance and say, well, I don't agree with that, I don't agree with that, I'm a Christian and you guys are losers or whatever. Um, I mean, there's a way to go about that. But I think it is important that Christians manifest a lifestyle, not just in the way they live, but what they talk about and how they address issues and problems. And especially when there's radical injustice that we speak up against it. And by the way, I don't think radical injustice is just like um, the oppression of people of color. I mean, that's that's kind of where those terms are resting right now. I think a much more radical injustice right now is abortion, because this isn't oppression. This is taking the life of these unborn children. I think an area of radical uh, oppression often is when the Christian ends up losing their job just for not conforming to the values of the culture. And uh, that's another type of, of oppression. I think um, being forced to mouth words and language that are inconsistent with our convictions, and this is the whole uh, gender issue, uh, and not misgendering and all the things associated with that. When we refuse to go along and live by lies, uh, this is an oppression issue too, but it doesn't usually fall under the standard oppression categories that the left is championing right now. So I think in our culture now, there's plenty of opportunity for Christians to be a light in such a way that it's going to draw uh, some heat, okay? Um, in your circumstance, I don't know, because I don't know you, Phil. And yeah, I, I get atheists on Facebook to make fun of me. Does that count? I mean, I, well, <laughs> well, if you and, don't count that I as persecution, that's good. It is, but it's not bothering you. That would bother a lot of Christians. That would bother some Christians so much that, that it would silence them when they're being made fun of. I'm just saying. So I would yeah. count that as persecution. And, yeah. and uh, I've, gotten, I've gotten pushback from non-Christians from, from speaking out on what I believe, but it's never been the kind of pushback that, you know, I, I always think of persecution as being something more radical. Yeah, that, but, it depends on know. the nature of the culture. And the persecution of Christians has not been radical in the past, and it is getting more radical now. Yeah. And much more radical than it used to be. And yeah. well, uh, this whole subject makes me nervous because I've always struggled with the eternal security and that kind of thing. Even though I have a reformed point of view, um, but you know, there's issues in my past and a struggle with depression and that kind of uh, stuff. Uh -huh. And, and um, so, you know. Doubts well, creep in. Well, let me and, let me offer a kind of thought thing. on this then. Okay, um, I have very strong convictions about this broader area that you've characterized as eternal security, and uh, I know there are verses that can be read um, as people losing their salvation. I think they're and and by the way, it's either one or the other. It's not half and half. So that means some verses that seem to say one thing actually mean something else. But when I look at the preponderance of passages, to me, the, the security of the believer is really um, 
strongly affirmed. And you can look at John chapter 6, you can look at John chapter 10, you can look at Romans chapter 8, you know, no one will be able to snatch you out of his hand, you know, or um, I guess that's John chapter 10, but uh, Romans 8 has more language like this, and I know people say, I know, but I can jump out of his hand. Wait a minute, look at the passage. Why can nobody snatch you out of the Father's hand? Because nobody is greater than the Father, and you can only jump out of Jesus' hand if you're greater than the Father. So Jesus is making a case for security based on the character of God himself. God secures that. But the... Yeah, I think for me it's, it's more like, you know, am I really a Christian mm. if, I, if I, you know, like to watch baseball now and then, or you know, to do secular things. Yes, well, wait, wait, wait. Why, why would baseball disqualify you, be, you being a real Christian? Well, you know, there's some um, joy or um, happiness I get, I get out of it, and at that moment in time, I'm not depending on Jesus for my joy, you know, because I'm um, enjoying something else other than Him. So okay. I, maybe I've got too much of a... a, a perfectionist view on this. But. Yeah, well, I don't think it's a perfectionist view. I just think it's a faulty view. Okay, think of this passage, and I don't even know where it's at. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forever. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forever. In other words, in addition to the joy we get in the Father, there are additional pleasures that God has provided for us to enjoy. Baseball is one of them, if you enjoy that. Every good and perfect gift, this is James 1, uh, comes down from heaven, so, is from the Father. So pleasures, pleasures could come under that category of that verse, is what you're talking about. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, your comment, I'm just saying here, you know who Amy Hall is, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, okay. That was a jaw-dropper moment. She has moment. lots of great things to say on... on um, STRS. I I agree. I agree. But I'm just saying, when you said made the comment about baseball, that was a jaw dropper for her because why is enjoying baseball somehow inimical to your relationship with God? It's not because the enjoyment you get from baseball is also coming from God. It's a good and perfect gift that comes down from heaven. All of these things God has provided because of His grace. There's a whole world of things to enjoy out there, and that's why Paul says, look, there's not, nothing, you, you, there are no rules about eating and drinking anymore. You know, if it's taken with thanksgiving, we can give thanks to God and enjoy the things that we have. And so you can take baseball with thanksgiving. I watch baseball. Oh, yeah, Amy is saying th this is a question that we answered to today on STR, hashtag STRask. It won't come out until, what, July or something like that. But uh, it, July 22nd is when it's going to actually air. But I think you're being way too hard on yourself, Phil. And I'm really glad you called. Okay. Um, I wanted to finish the thought about eternal, eternal security, and I just wanted to say that when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit enters you and changes you inside. It's called the new birth, okay? You know, that you are a new creature. If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away and new things have come. There is, that's called regeneration. Now, I'm convinced from the text, from the teaching about the nature of salvation, that regeneration is a miracle God works inside an individual, and it's irreversible. When it happens, you don't get unborn again. And you certainly can't get unborn again by sinning. Because sin, if the blood of Christ came to cancel out sin, how can any sin cancel out the blood of Christ? It can't. You are secure in Christ. Um, and, and, and there are many verses I could go to. I mentioned Romans 8, but I just, I just want to read this for your benefit, and then I have something else that I want to say um, just about baseball and some things like that, okay? In Romans 8, the end of the chapter, and I'm flipping over here now. Well, I'm, act I'm actually not flipping over. I'm flipping the pages over, but Romans 8, and uh, it, this strikes me as unequivocal language that Paul is giving about the security of the Christian. 
And here's what he says, verse 38 and 39, for I am convinced, now listen to the categories here as they apply to you, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Meaning, once you are in Christ Jesus, you are rock solid secure. And what Paul does here in verse 38 and 39 of Romans 8 is almost hyperbolically, like to an exaggerated degree, lists every possible thing and area that might someone might think could interfere with the flow of God's love towards us. And he says, no way. No way at all. Now, that's just one of many, many verses. And I want you to take comfort in that. And whether yeah. a person's a Christian or not, I, I actually wrote a, a mentoring letter. And Amy, when is, is that coming out? Is that the one that just came out, the mentoring letter on? Or is that the one coming? That's the one that just came out. Okay, so if you get our material, it just came out. If not, you can go to our website, and it's something like, how do you know you're really a Christian or whatever. So it's that issue. And I talk about ways of being confident about it. But I want Yeah, I wrote that. Okay, good. So I want you to look at that and read it carefully. Uh, I even gave it to my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter. She went on a trip to Summit this week, and she got on the plane. I gave her the printed letter, and I said, yeah, I want you to read this, honey. So, um, but, but I, there's another aspect that I just want you to really be clear on. <clears throat> the, God has made an entire world of things for us to enjoy. Those are not enjoyed outside of Him, those are enjoyed within our relationship with Him, okay? And because, you know, a man's, a Christian husband's love for his wife is deeply and profoundly satisfying to him, and it isn't, that's not his love for God, that's his love for his wife, that doesn't take away at all from his relationship with God. It isn't like dissing God because you love your wife. You're enjoying right. things like baseball and a meal. And, uh, you know, these are things God wants you to enjoy. They're not sinful. These are, right. these are appropriate things to enjoy, and they are, they are not separated from the life you have in Christ. They are included in the life you have in Christ. They may not sound spiritual. They sound, you know, I think this is a word that you even use, secular. But right. in, in the Christian life, there is no distinction like that. It isn't like, well, we have our life with God, and then we have these other dull, ordinary, or maybe fun, but secular things that we do that are unrelated to God. No, look at when I—you know how you give grace? You give thanks at a meal, right? Right. Thank God. Okay, when I bite into a good hamburger like I did last night, I'm even thanking God again for the bite. I said, oh, this is great. And I'm encountering things during the day, and I'm enjoying stuff. I've just been fishing with my brother in northern Wisconsin. We had a couple of fun days out there. And uh, what did we do? We thanked God for our fishing, the opportunity He gave us to do that. I'm just right. giving you a couple of mundane examples to make the point that the mundane enjoyments are things that you can enjoy before God. They are His gift to you. As long as they aren't in themselves sinful, they are His gift towards you. And you can okay. enjoy that without any concern that it's somehow undermining your safety in Christ. All right? Okay. All right, Sounds Phil. good. I, I got to tell you, I love Jesus with my whole heart. Well, God and bless you. He's my only hope. That's right. You know? And, and he will continue he's to be He's my ultimate so. hope, mm -hmm. no matter what baseball game I watch, mm -hmm. you know. Please so. read that piece that I wrote that just came out on the 1st of June. If you didn't get it in the mail or your email, then uh, you can find it on our website. And then you can also, also sign up to receive this stuff on a regular basis there and register. So, because uh, I want you to be encouraged about your safety and confidence in Christ and your confidence to enjoy all the wonderful things that God has given us that don't, at first glance, seem religious, but are still gifts from God. All right? 
All right. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much, Greg. You're welcome, Phil. It's good, it. Yeah, it's good talking to you. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Let, let's do a, a quick... Uh, no, do we have time to go? Okay, let's just go to our next caller. Let's do that. Okay, and that would be, because we've got so many people on board here, that would be Susan in Whittier, California. Susan, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Hi, Susan. Yes. So welcome to the show. This is Greg Kokel. Thank you. Sure. Um, wow. Um, that's almost a carbon copy of the call you just had. Right. <laughs> I'm, I see the question up here. So why don't you go and ask it? Maybe we'll go into a little more detail on that. Um, yeah. I wrote down, read Romans 8, 38 and 39. That's right. About you can't lose your salvation. That's right. If and you... I and just like your previous caller, um, I I struggle with depression. Mm-hmm. I have for I have for a long long time. Mm-hmm. And I th- the main difference I have with your previous caller is um I lost my husband mm. um, almost a year and a half ago, so I'm on my own. Mm. So I just. I just have my daughter and I. Mm-hmm. So. Well, you're n- just to encourage you, you're not on your own entirely. The Lord is with you. But I understand it's hard to lose someone you love that you've been with for so long. And there is a loneliness that you experience. And that's true. Um, I mean, I experience loneliness at different times for different reasons, even though I know the Lord. And I, I want to, uh, I, I'm going to give you another passage in a minute that you might write the reference down and reflect on when you feel you're not sure about your salvation. But I, I want to go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2, when God created Adam. And he made a, he made a statement there. This is before he created Eve. And what he said in Genesis 2 is, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. Now, let me ask you a question. Was Adam alone? Was Adam alone? Who said it's not good for man to be alone? Who said that? God said it, right? Oh, Oh, yes, of course. Yes, okay, so... God was there with Adam, correct? Right. So was Adam alone? No. No, he wasn't. He had God there with him. But notice when God said this, he's making it clear that us being with God is not enough. God made us to be with other people. God made us to be in relationship with others. So there is a level of intimacy and heartfelt satisfaction that we have from being with God, but he also designed us so that there is a, there's a whole area of satisfaction that we experience with someone else that God doesn't, uh, that that's a a need that God doesn't fill. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm thinking a lot of people don't realize this, and so when you lose... Go ahead. Um, Greg, do you do you mean another spouse? I mean another person. In this case, it was a spouse. It was a suitable helpmate for, for for Adam. <clears throat> and the the point I'm making here is not that you need to find another spouse. I'm just making the point that you were made to be with someone like you were with your husband for all those years. And that means when you lose your husband, then it's going to be hard. And even if you're close with God. It doesn't take the difficulty away that uh, th- that's caused by by you losing your husband. Okay. I don't want to be with any. I don't want another spouse. No, correct. I understand that. What I'm what I'm um, trying to do is is to help you understand that it's reasonable, even though you're a Christian, to be really sad and even depressed that you lost your husband because your husband was really important to you, 
and God made you to be with another person, and that's why you were with your husband for all that time. So it's natural right. when he's gone that you would feel bad. And that's the point right. I'm making. That's the only point that I'm making here. I'm not saying you have to get remarried. I'm simply saying that I get it. You lost your husband, and your husband filled a role and met a need in your life emotionally that God himself did not intend to fill. That's why he said in Genesis 2, it's not good for man to be alone. Even though God was right there with Adam, and Adam wasn't even fallen at that point. It was an unfallen right. fellowship with God, but God knew because of the way he made Adam, there was some need that Adam had that God was not going to fulfill directly in relationship with him. And Until that's why he created a suitable helpmate. Yeah, until Eve gave him the apple. Well, this comes later. God gave Eve to him to be the helpmate that God was talking about in that passage. And the simple point is, apart from what happens later, my simple point is we need each other. We were made to be close with each other. And when someone important is taken from us, it's, it's going to be painful. And we're going to miss them and we're going to be depressed. But that's not a reflection, necessarily, on our relationship with God, all right? We, even though we're close to God, there are some needs that God designed us to have that He did not intend to directly fill. That's the point I'm making here. But I, I wanted to offer you another, another thought, uh, another passage about eternal security, the the, the 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 safety that you have in Christ, all right? And okay. I, I gave you the Romans 8 passage. I'm glad you wrote the reference down. This one's in, right. this one's in John 10. This one's in okay. John 10. And it starts in verse 27. <clears throat> okay, John. John 10, verse 27 and following. Okay. And... Uh, John... Okay, John 10, yes. 27. Through 29. Okay. John 10, 27, 29. Correct. Okay. All right, okay. so I'll, you have the reference. You can read it later, but I'm going to read it to you, okay? And here Jesus is saying, he's talking about his sheep. That is the sheep that belong to him. Okay, that would be Christians. Not everyone is Jesus' sheep. The non-Christians aren't Jesus' sheep. Christians exactly. are Jesus. Okay, good. Exactly. So here's what he says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In other words, we have become Christians because Jesus is drawing us to him. All right? And then he right. says, and I give eternal life to them. That's the order. They hear because Jesus knows them, and they respond, and then Jesus gives them eternal life, okay? And then he says this, verse 28, and they will never perish. And they will never perish. If you are one of Jesus' sheep, if you have responded to him to receive eternal life, Jesus says, you will never perish. Okay. You can't that lose you, your salvation. You're not going to lose it, Susan. And I, it grieves me that there are people who are worried about that, like you've expressed. But let me finish the text, okay? That, they okay. will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Okay? So you are, in a sense, in Jesus' hand. Jesus says, you're not going to perish because no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. And then he says, he gives another layer of this, verse 29, my Father who has given them to me, that means the Father has given you to Jesus to be his, my Father is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now, it's interesting the way Jesus puts it here, and I only got about 40 seconds, so I just want you to drink this in. Jesus says, the Father has put 
you in my hand, and no one will snatch you out of my hand, because the Father has given you to me. He's greater than all, and no one will snatch you out of his hand either. So in other words, you're in Jesus' hand, and you're in the Father's hand. I, I had So Jesus' hand and the Father's hand, put your two hands together. One hand is Jesus, one hand is the Father, and you're safe inside. <laughs> All right? I had one, one friend call that the divine sandwich. We are right in the middle of the divine sandwich, and we are eternally safe because no one is greater than the Father. And I give that to you, Susan, as kind of a parting word. I hope you go back and meditate a bit on these verses I've offered to you because your confidence and your safety is really, really important. I'm so glad you called. Greg Kokel here for Stand to Reason. Give them heaven, friends. Bye-bye now.